everybody likes to read or see an unlikely success story. In other words, somebody who really shouldn't have succeeded, the odds were against them, but they did succeed and they excelled. And we like to read stories and books about unlikely success stories. We like to see documentaries on TV about unlikely success stories. And, and what I want you to see here, and, and get this now, okay? The 12 disciples, and you just saw the calling of four of those, but the, the 12 disciples that Jesus called to be his, his guys, they are a great example of unlikely success stories, with Judas Iscariot being the notable exception. Uh, they, they were unlikely success stories. You see, most of the, uh, get out my, my laser pointer here, most of the, we're going to bring up the map, most of these guys that Jesus called were from an area called Galilee, and that may not mean much to you, so I brought up a map of the nation of Israel, and this is Israel right here, and, uh, uh oh is it not working? <laughs> my answer for fixing everything is just to beat it. That, that worked, all right. That's how I fix everything, just kick it, beat it, you know. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, you look, this is the nation of Israel. You got Jerusalem, Bethlehem, where Jesus was born down here. This is southern area called Judea. Samaria was central. That's blue. The yellow up here was the northern area, and it was called Galilee. And it was a very agricultural region. The Sea of Galilee right here, this area, this, of course, was central to this area. It was a, that, that map doesn't do it justice. It's a humongous sea. Um, and it's sometimes called uh, Gennesaret, Lake of Tiberias, had different names. But the Sea of Galilee was also a central part. Of course, fishing was huge. Uh, so you had up here in this area, you had just a lot of um, uh, farmers, uh, fishermen, blue collar type people. And not only that, we know that many of the, the 12, it's not working again. There we go. Yeah. Many of the 12 <laughs> were from the shoreline area of Galilee, which would be, I'm sorry, it'd be over here. So you got the shoreline around the, uh, the Sea of Galilee, and many of the 12 were from this shoreline area. Well, that's interesting because people who lived and worked in that area were really looked down on because they were viewed as less educated, which for the most part they were. They were seen as lower class people. They were viewed as less religious uh, as far as keeping the law of God, which they were. And yet in this area, Jesus kind of made that area in Galilee like the home base of his ministry. And, and that area is where our story comes from. So let's go to Luke 5 and let's read it. Okay, look at Luke 5 verse number 1. It says, And it came to pass that as the people pressed upon Jesus to hear the word of God, then he stood by the lake of Gennesaret, that's the Sea of Galilee, and he saw two ships standing by the lake, but the fishermen were gone out of them and were washing their nets. So he entered into one of the ships, which was Simon's, that's Peter, and he prayed, he asked him if he thrust out a little from the land, and he sat down, Jesus taught the people out of the ship. And when he had left or quit speaking, he said to Simon Peter, he said, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a drought, big catch of fish. And Simon answering said to him, Master, we do all the night and taken nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, I'll let down the net. And when they had this done, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes, and their net broke. And they beckoned to their partners, which were in the other ship, that they would come and help them. And they came and they filled both, both the ships so that they began to sink. There were so many fish. And when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, and he said, Depart from me, for I'm a sinful man, O Lord. For he was astonished, and all that were with him at the drought of the fishes which they had taken. And so was also James and John, the sons of Zebedee, which were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Fear not, from hereafter you shall catch men. And when they had brought their ships to land, they forsook all, and what, church? Followed him. Followed him. Now, if you look at the map again, Capernaum, which you see right here, I don't know if you can see that, but Capernaum was one of those seaside towns and cities. And uh, Jesus was here a lot. That's where this story takes place. 
And this is one of those areas and cities where Jesus ministered to the, quote, lower class, right? Because that was Jesus. He reached out to people that other people looked down on. He would reach out to them, and he would embrace them and welcome them. And so Jesus is teaching these crowds of people there at Capernaum, there by the Sea of Galilee. And four of the eventual 12 were nearby. While he was teaching, they were over here cleaning their equipment, cleaning their nets, uh, and, and, and their boats. And it was Peter, Andrew, James, and John. And what I want to really emphasize to you guys is that they were ordinary guys. They were just ordinary, blue-collar, hard-working guys just like us. And yet Jesus called them to be his disciples. He wanted them to follow him. He, he wanted them to be close to him. And so my, my question for you today is, do you desire to follow Christ? You know, do you want to take it to the next level in 2020? Do you want to truly allow Christ to use your life that you've been given on this earth? Do you want him to use your life? Because he's calling. The question is this. Will you answer the call? And I love how Monica put the cell phone in the top of the handout there. I thought that was kind of nifty. I didn't tell her to do that. She came up with that. And you notice at the top of your handout, Jesus is calling. Hey, how many of you guys would be honest with me? How many of you have ever gotten a phone call on your cell phone and didn't answer it? Don't lie in church. All right, let me go a step further. This is real good confession time right now. How many of you would even say this? I've gotten a phone call, and I knew who was calling me and chose not to answer. Come on. Confession's good for the soul. All right. Whenever someone calls, right, you got a, you got a choice, right? Every time you get a phone call, you got a choice. You can either hit answer, reject. Or you may not hit either, and you may just hit kind of like silence so that it quits ringing. And Jesus Christ is calling. And will you answer his call? Will you answer? Are you going to reject? Or are you going to just kind of silence it? Well, what does this calling involve? What does this calling look like? I think that's important because we got to know what we're getting into, right? So what does the calling of Jesus look like? And that's what I want to talk about this morning from our text, is I want to look at what does that involve? What does it look like? Well, number one is this. I want you to write this in your handout. Number one is that Jesus, when he calls you, it is a call to leave your comfort zone. And, uh, and you know, and, and as, we, as we look at this, I want you to get the scene with me. That's why I showed you the video. I mean, videos aren't perfect. They're not going to be able to actually portray everything. But I showed you the video because I wanted you to at least get somewhat of a mental image of what's going on here in the text. All right. And so Peter and Andrew, James, and John, they've been out all night fishing. Okay. This was not a hobby. This, was, this wasn't like what they did on Saturday. This was their job. They were commercial fishermen, all right? And, and that was common in that area, the Sea of Galilee. So they had done this for years. They, you know, uh, James and John worked with their dad, Zebedee, and then this, they all worked together. This was their job. Jesus Christ is teaching God's truth to a bunch of people there, crowd of people. Peter and, and his, uh, his comrades, they're over here cleaning up everything, which is what they should be doing. If you're a commercial fisherman, you can't afford to let your equipment be dirty. You can't let nets be put up wet because wet uh, nets that are, not, that are put up wet and they're not clean rot. And so that's part of being a fisherman. You come in after a hard night's work and you got to clean up everything. So they're cleaning the nets and cleaning their ships and cleaning their equipment. And then Jesus come along, he comes along, and then he, as he's teaching, he sees these ships, and he just kind of commandeers one of the boats for his purposes. Well, at this, it was, it was Peter's boat. And, and at this point, Peter would have been familiar with Christ. Christ wasn't a stranger to him. He knew of him. He didn't know him personally. He hadn't followed him yet. Peter's still working his fishing job. But, but he knew of Christ. He had at least met him one other time. He did not know him personally, though. So he takes Peter's boat and starts using it. I wonder what Peter was thinking as he watched all this. It, it appears that at some point, Peter got back into the boat when Jesus was in there. I mean, maybe he was protected. Would you be protective of your boat? 
You know, this guy gets in your boat, right? And you're like, oh, I better get back in my boat. Make sure he doesn't mess with anything, right? So he gets back in the boat. Well, Jesus says to Peter, Peter, let's thrust out a little bit from the land. Now, why would he tell him that? Well, there are many practical reasons. Jesus wouldn't be crushed by the crowd. The Bible says he was being pressed on by the crowds. So if he gets in the, in the ship and, and goes out a little bit into the lake, now there's some separation between him and the crowd. Now, then he'd be able to see him better. Though that video really doesn't do the boats justice. It would have been big commercial uh, fishing boats and ships. And so Jesus would have been elevated. He'd have been out on the lake a little bit, and everybody would have been able to see him better. And they'd be able to hear him better because if you've ever been uh, out 40, 50 yards out on the water from the shore, you know that people on the shore can hear you out there perfectly because the water acts as a sounding board. So you got all these great reasons why Jesus said thrust out a little bit from the land. I think more importantly, Jesus wanted to spend some personal time interaction time with Peter. I think that was probably the, the biggest reason why Jesus said that. What do you think Peter is thinking when Jesus says, hey, Peter, um, I want you to take this ship out a little bit from the land. I wonder what Peter, what was going through his mind? Uh, uh, you know, um, I just cleaned this boat. <laughs> uh, I'm tired. I'm hungry. I've been up all night. We caught nothing. I am not in the best of moods. I want to go to the house. <laughs> and I want to collapse in bed. Right? So how many of y'all just get to the point where you just want to go to the house? Amen. Yeah. Denise will be out shopping. And finally, I've had enough. I'll say, let's go to the house. <laughs> well, hold on five more minutes. Let's go to the house. <laughs> Let's just go to the house, you know. Sometimes you just want to go to the house, right? And, and so Peter's like, I just want to go to the house. I just want to go and collapse. I am tired. This is my boat, Jesus. This is my boat. <laughs> but he does it. He thrusts out a little from the lamp. He does what Jesus said. Jesus now is sitting there, and he's teaching the, the crowd more about the Bible. And, and Peter, oh, Peter, he's out there with Jesus in the boat, you know, and now he's kind of a captive audience unless he wants to jump out of the boat and swim to shore. He's kind of a captive audience now. He's got a front row seat listening to Jesus out there, you know, in the boat. And then look at verse number four. This is the kicker right here. Look at verse four. Now, when he had left or quit speaking, when Jesus was done, you know, speaking, he said to Simon, launch out where? Deep. Into the deep. And let down your nets for a drought. He, <laughs> Jesus says, hey, Peter. Remember, he's been out all night fishing. Let's launch it back out into the deep, Peter. And when we get there, let down your nets. You know, the nets that you just got done drying and cleaning. <laughs> Come on, man, let's go back out and do some fishing. Do you think Peter and his partners were beginning to squirm a little bit? <laughs> it appears that they were. They had been fishing all night. Jesus asks them to do something that they undoubtedly did not want to do. And probably found to be ridiculous. And do you know what Peter learned that day, church? You know what he learned? that day and that he would continue to learn from that day forward here's what Peter learned Jesus routinely inconveniences his followers did you know his main concern up in heaven is not your convenience sorry that's not his main concern is your convenience If someone signs up for the military and they go to boot camp, is the drill sergeant's main concern the convenience of the new recruits? <laughs> Does he meet with the new recruits and the drill sergeant say, we just want you to be, have a comfortable stay for the next eight weeks. And we don't want to do anything that would inconvenience. No, the drill sergeant has a job and a mission to do, and that is to get those guys ready to be soldiers, ready for combat, ready to battle. 
And in the same way, we are soldiers for Jesus Christ, the Bible says. And God is on a mission. And God, it's a serious thing that God is up to. God is wanting to get the message of Jesus Christ out to this world that needs it so desperately. And those of us who are saved, we are his soldiers. We are in his army. And God's main concern, just like that drill sergeant, his main concern is not our convenience. It's to get us ready to be able to make battle for Jesus Christ. Christ set the example, didn't he? He's, a, he's our leader. And you look at that cross right there. Can you imagine having to carry that? Jesus Christ carried that cross up a hill. And, and he carried it as far as he could. And then he had to have help. And when he got to the top of the hill, they took Jesus and they nailed his body to that cross. They nailed his hands. They nailed his feet. They took a crown of thorns and they mashed it down into his skull. And he died for our sin. He took our sin upon him. And I want you to know none of that was convenient for Jesus Christ. None of that was comfortable for him. Yeah. Do you want to be a Christ follower? Yes. It is a call to leave your comfort zone. Yeah. Hey, what did we sing earlier? We sung the world behind me, the cross before me. Jesus said... Take up your cross and follow me. That's not a call to convenience. When he said take up your cross, they knew exactly what he meant. And you know, how the, the Christian life is a wonderful, exciting, exhilarating life. But it is a call to leave your comfort zone. Some of you in here, the way this applies to your life is that you're here today, and we're so glad you're here, but you're, you're not saved yet. You haven't kind of gotten off the fence yet. You don't know whether or not you want to follow Christ or not. You're not sure that you want to trust Christ as your Savior. You're skeptical. Maybe you're searching, you're looking, you're considering, but you have not made a commitment to Jesus Christ yet. You haven't entered into a relationship with Christ yet. And that is a decision that you have to make, and Christ is calling you to make that decision. You know, sometimes you'll ask people, you'll ask, hey, if you died today, do you know for sure that you would go to heaven? Uh, you ask people, hey, do you know for sure that you're a Christian? And people will be like, well, I think I'm a Christian. I think I'll go to heaven. Yeah, yeah, I think I am a Christian. You know what? That would be like me saying... You know what? I think I'm married to Denise. I think I am. What do you mean? You think you are? Either you are or you aren't. <laughs> right? I think I'm a Christian. No, either you've entered into a relationship with Jesus or you haven't. You know, some people I've talked to, they'll be like, you know, well, you know what? I feel like I've always been a Christian. Can you imagine if I said to you, you know what? I've always been married to Denise. No, there was a point in time when I made a choice to enter into a covenant relationship of marriage with Denise. There was a point in time when she asked me to marry her and I said yes. <laughs> Here I am lying right in church. Stretching the truth a little bit, huh? A lot. I begged her to marry me and she said yes. <laughs> But no, I mean, you get my point? It's not, I think I'm a Christian. Man, I think I've always been a Christian. No, no. There's a point in time when you make a choice. You make a decision. Yes, I want Jesus. Yes, I want a relationship with him. Yes, I want to believe on him. And I want to trust him to be my Lord and my Savior. Amen. There's got to come a point in time when you make that decision. Got to be a point in time when you answer the call. You know, Jesus is calling. Some of you remember that, right? When you were, Jesus was calling you to be saved. And to trust him. And you know what? When he calls you, you either going to answer, reject, or silence it. And you know what I mean by silence, right? And some people are like, well, I'm not going to that church anymore. I just, I feel guilty every time I go to that church. I'm not going back. That's just like hitting the silence button on your phone, right? I'm just going to silence it. I just don't even want to hear it. Well, Jesus is calling. And some of you need to leave your comfort zone. And you need to enter into a relationship with Jesus Christ. And then there's some of you in here that you are saved, you do know the Lord, 
you have entered into that relationship with Christ. And if I was to ask you, if I was to say, um, how are you doing in your walk with Christ? You might would say to me, well, I'm doing okay. Okay. Anybody ever seen that commercial that's come out that just okay is not okay? <laughs> you know, just okay is not okay in some things in life. And I would say the Christian walk, walk is one of those. That commercial, you know, where the, 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 the person's sitting there, they're laying in the hospital bed, they're about to have surgery, and they ask the nurse, so do you know Dr. So-and-so? And the nurse says, yeah, I know him. He's okay. <laughs> Just okay? <laughs> the guy gets the scared look, and then about that time, the doctor comes through the door, the doctor hobbles down the hallway, hey, I just got reinstated. <laughs> Comes in the room, looks at the guy in the hospital bed. Hey, you ready for surgery? Yeah. Oh, good. He's like, you scared? The guy goes, yeah. He goes, no, me too. <laughs> but we'll figure it out. I'll see you in there. There's times when just okay is not okay. And if I were to say to you, how's your walk with Christ? And you say, oh, it's okay. I mean, I, I make it to church most of the time when I don't you know, have anything more pressing. I read the Bible sometimes, and I pray some, and I have spurts of generosity, and, you know, every once in a while, I'll step up and maybe serve in an event at the church. I'm doing okay. Christ is calling you to go deeper. He wants you to, he wants you to do more, and you know that. Some of you in here are like, you know that. The Holy Spirit's been dealing with you, and you know okay, just okay, not okay. And you know you're capable of so much more. Some of you have been in here in church for a while, and you've been sitting on spiritual gifts. You've been sitting on uh, God-given abilities that God gave you for a long time. You know, maybe it's musical abilities or teaching abilities or working with kids or like the, the, what we saw this morning, you know, the, the first impressions. You got a great smile. You're friendly. You could be such an asset to people that are coming to our church for the first time to greet them or help them park their car or give them a handout and smile and, and, and help show them, you know, where to go put their kid. You can be such an asset to our first impressions team, but you're sitting on your gifts. You're sitting on your abilities. You're sitting on those things God's given you. And, and some of you, the message for today is that, hey, it's time to step out of your comfort zone and it's time to use them. It's time to get off the bench and on the playing field. It's time to get into the game. And that's the message, I think, for some of us here today, is that just okay is not okay. you got to step it up. <coughs> and you know what? This year, you're going to see opportunities. You're going to be faced with opportunities this year to go deeper, to do something meaningful and impactful and significant for Christ. And you know what the decision is going to be for you? Same as Peter. You're going to have to make a decision, and, and it's in your handout. I hope you'll write this down. And that is either your, your decision is going to be either stay safe on the shore or launch out into the deep with Jesus. That's going to be the choice. Either you're going to, either you're going to stay safe on the shore or you're going to launch out into the deep with Jesus. That's like today, you know, you look at the handout, and on the front, Discovering Crossroads. <laughs> Some of you have been coming to the church a long time. Maybe you've been coming for weeks, maybe it's months. We've had people come for years, and then finally decide, you know what, I need commitment. I need to become, I want to have a church home, I want to have a church family, because sometimes people are like, you know, they come to church incognito, and then they slip right back out, and you know what? They're like undercover church attenders. <laughs> you know what I mean? They like slip in, slip out, and anybody to know them. They, you know, and, and it's like, no, Christ is calling you to go deeper. Christ is calling you to do more. And for some of you, it looks like that. that hey, I need, I need to go to the membership class. I need a church home. I need to be committed someplace. Some of you, like I said, it's the back of the car. It's the first impressions. You're able to do that. You say, well, I'm just not going to be convenient for my... Listen, the, the, the call of Christ is a call to leave your comfort zone and to be inconvenienced for Christ. And, you know, some of you, 
you're going to have opportunities this year to share your faith with people. You could share your faith with a coworker that needs it. You could share your faith with a niece or nephew, a, gr a grandson, a granddaughter, a, you know, maybe your mom or dad. Maybe you share your faith with a brother or sister or a friend from high school. But you'll have an opportunity to share your faith. And you're either going to stay safe on the shore or you're going to launch out into the deep. And you're going you're gonna to take that opportunity and, and, and you're going to launch out and you're going to do it. It's a matter of leaving your comfort zone and doing it. If we're going to truly follow Christ and be his disciples, it's a call to leave your comfort zone. You think it was comfortable? Peter, James, John, Andrew, all they'd ever known was fishing. And they had this, this fishing business. And, and then you saw the video of the guy that stayed in the boat. You're like, who is that? That's Zebedee. That's James and John's dad. That's exactly how it happened. They left their dad standing at the boat and went and followed Christ when he called. I mean, they worked with their dad every day. I'm sure they were very close to their dad. And so Peter and Andrew leave their boat, leave the equipment, leave their nets. Uh, 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 James and John leave their dad and leave all their stuff. And they follow Christ. It's a call to leave your comfort zone. And many of you in here are capable of doing so much. And you're only touching the hem of the garment. Of what you could do for Christ. And today Christ is calling. <laughs> He's calling. <laughs> are you going to answer or reject or silence? What are you going to do? I hope you'll answer that call. How does this look for you? Only you can decide that. Maybe it's a more commitment to the Bible. Maybe it's a commitment to being more generous on a regular basis. Maybe it's a commitment to serve. Maybe it's a commitment to begin praying faithfully. Maybe it's a commitment to do the Bible reading. I don't know what it looks like for you, but let's make those decisions that God wants us to make. We're going to sing again here in a moment with the band, and, and we're going to kind of hopefully sing and express to God in song the commitments of what we've made in our hearts today. So let's bow our heads right now, and let's pray together. Ushers, if you'll prepare for our offering, I hope that decisions are being made all over the building right now. I want you to get in the habit of every, remember what we said last week? Every time you hear the Bible this year and God speaks to your heart, I want you to obey, act on it, do it. Our motto at Crossroads is learning the Bible, living the Bible. Every time you learn something from the Bible this year, I want you to make a commitment that you're going to try to live it. So right now, make that a habit that when I have you bow your head and close your eyes, it's not about lunch. It's not about football. It's about, no, it's about me and God. What decisions does he want me to make? Father, we thank you, God, for your word today. Lord, bless this offering.